So welcome to the Contemporary Art Center. I'm so excited you're all here. I can't tell you how really thrilled I am to open Wills Hayes and Khalil Robert Irving's Groundwater from Screen Falls, Collaged Media, and Midwest Street. We've been working very, very hard for an entire month on the truly remarkable, all-encompassing installation of Wills, um, which is an interesting combination of a survey of his artistic pra practice for the last 15 years, uh, and at the same time, a lot of new commissions, a lot of new works to create really a holistic a holistic work of art, a, a holistic installation that allows you to get really deep insight into his artistic practice around the globe. Um, and Khalil's work in the lobby is just a truly remarkable project that reflects on um, Khalil's own biography on black life in the Midwest <clears throat> and how especially social media has such an incredible impact on um, how we think about race, politics, and civic life in, in, or within urban realities. So both of these shows are truly remarkable, and I'm so glad that we can celebrate them with you tonight. I want to thank um, the sponsors for Wills. It was very generously supported by David and Isabella Grutman, the private gallery of John J. Tilly, Stephen and Sandra Chaffee, Jimmy and Lauren Miller, the, the Jason McCaw Exhibition Fund, FOMICA, 1919 Investment Council, Jim and Linda Miller, and the supporter of, supporters of the CAC Exhibition Fund, and really, truly, any donation that anyone would ever want to make to the Exhibition Fund is so valuable, so tremendously valuable to the work that we do here day in and day out with so many different artists from different walks of life in different parts of the world. So um, just let us know if this is something that you want to consider. Um, <laughs> and then um, Khalil Robert Irving's lobby project has received generous funding from the Kaplan Foundation and also the supporters of the CAC Exhibition Fund and our season sponsors are Artswave, the Ohio Arts Council, and the National Endowment for the Arts. So um, here at the Contemporary Arts Center, we feel that we, we provide you with experiences, cultural experiences that prepare you for today for the here and now, the present moment that we all share, this very confusing, complex, multifaceted reality that we all try to navigate in our own shapes and forms. And um, contemporary artists are an amazing, provide an amazing window, an amazing perspective into the world that we all share. And sometimes the work is a little bit challenging because the current moment is challenging. Sometimes the work is uplifting and transformative, but that's what we are here to do. Um, we try to navigate not only culture, but really the world as we get to experience it um, through different filters, um, through different eyes. We try to navigate that for you um, with the incredible artists that we invite and have the great luxury to work with. Um, so I hope that you will say yes to your continued support. Thank you for everything you do for the Contemporary Art Center. And I'm really thrilled tonight to introduce you to, of course, Wills or Alex. Um, Alexandre, is it Alexandre? I don't have the Portuguese down very well. Um, Alex, we just call him Alex Farto. And um, then also tonight here on stage, we will be joined by Roger Gastman. So I'm gonna um, give you a little bit of background um, of Roger first. Roger is a cultural producer and historian with a special interest in art and mark making in urban spaces. He founded and co-founded Swindle Magazine, which remain, remains a cornerstone for the graphic design community. He co-authored The History of American Graffiti, one of the preeminent books on graffiti in the United States. 
Roger has been involved in, sev in several highly acclaimed films on the subject of graffiti and street art, such as Banksy's Exit Through the Gift Shop, which, as many of you um, will know, earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Documentary, The Legend of Cool, Disco Dan, and Wall Riders. He was also instrumental in bringing graffiti and street art inside major American museums. Um, LA MOCA's Art in the Street exhibit saw record-breaking attendance, and so did Pump Me Up, DC subculture of the 1980s at the Corcoran Gallery of Art and MCA Denver's Exhibitions Wall Writers. So as most of you know, the CAC has its own legendary roster of projects that have brought many street art artists into the galleries, such as Beautiful Losers, which we did in 2004, and our major one project, one person projects with Shepard Ferry, Keith Herring, JR, Swoon, and now Wills. So Portuguese, Portuguese artist um, Alex Farto has been working in the urban environment under the name of Wills since his days as a very prolific graffiti writer in the early and mid um, 2000s. His groundbreaking carving technique into building walls has been hailed as one of the most compelling approaches to art created in streets in the last decade. And at the core of his work um, is truly a reflection on identity in a global society, um, a society that is shaped by media saturation, by culturally, cultural uniformity, um, just through globalization and consumption. Um, since 2005, Alex has presented his works in over 30 countries and truly around the globe in many different solo exhibitions and group shows, um, site-specific art interventions, artistic events and projects just in different communities and in very different concepts, con concepts, contexts, sorry. Uh, from working in communities um, in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro to collaborations with um, reputable art institutions such as the um, EDP Foundation in Lisbon, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Barbican Center in London, um, the um, CAFA Art Museum in Beijing, and the Contemporary Art Museum in um, San Diego, San Diego I mean, among many others. He is an avid experimentalist. He works in a lot of different media, technology, um, carving, metal etching, stencil painting, um, explosions, video, sculptural installations, and he has also directed several music videos. Many of you might, might know U2's Raised by Wolves, short films, and stage productions. So um, I welcome the two of you here on stage. And then... Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, and I brought one of the catalogs that Roger did, Art in the Streets, which lives on my bookshelf, among many other books that Roger has done. And um, Wills has an amazing catalog, hot off the press. It weighs five kilos, 10 pounds, <laughs> and um, I just couldn't carry it together with this book. So you can find it in the gift store and also in our store we have a few truly wonderful prints by Alex and um, yes, the catalog. So I thought we'll just start talking a little bit about what drew you so much to the urban environment, like why the streets, why buildings? You could have worked in a studio or just on your laptop, you grew up with um, you know, the internet readily available to you? Like, why the streets? Uh, well, first of all, good night. Thank you for all for coming, and, and thank you, Rafael, for having me and the whole team um, that did a great job. You're gonna all see the show after. So thank you very much for you guys. <laughs> thank you for all Roger as well to accept it, to be here as well, which is an honor and a pleasure. So I hope this will go well. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for, 
in, in terms of uh, the work and how I started, uh, was basically I was a, a kid growing up and, and the hip hop culture was kind of arriving in Portugal at the time and uh, I got involved in the graffiti scene uh, quite young, I was 13. Um, and it was something that gave me kind of, you know, a group of friends and something that gave me initiative to participate in a public space, mm -hmm. to paint, to feel emancipated in a way that I could do art creation. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it kind of took over my life, in a way. Right. <laughs> uh, and I, I continued, I never gave up. Um, and then eventually when I was 16, 17, I kind of wanted to push the limits of what I was doing. And I will always was surrounded uh, in the in the place where I was born and raised. Uh, it's um, it's on the suburb of Lisbon, so it's, Lisbon is al already a suburb of Europe. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, and and I kind of saw a lot of there was a big culture of murals in the 70s uh, because we had a revolution and there was a lot of political murals everywhere. And then in the 80s, a big boom with advertisements. Mm -hmm. So you had billboards and kind of left-wing murals opposing each other in the same street and then the billboards went over the murals and then graffiti showed up in the 90s mm -hmm. and it went over and the council started to paint everything white it went over again so I, I always was very paying attention to how the history was affecting the walls of the city and the, and, mm -hmm. and the walls of the city were absorbing all of this mm -hmm. um, so that's when you know the walls were so <laughs> messy that I came up with the idea of and studying uh, of painting because I was as well building all these layers of just going on a wall and instead of adding extracting and painting with the layers that were um, inside of the wall so I was in a way painting with layers of history um, and then the work evolved from there huh? uh, maybe I'm going too far now <laughs> no, 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 no. no not at all um, what's interesting about Lisbon is that the city because of very different political regimes um, just had very different visual expression of what was going on politically, socially. And then of course, as you said, um, in the 80s and 90s, there was just an oversaturation of advertisement and graffiti and um, probably also electronic devices. So you grew up in a city that just had a lot of layers and a lot of different just visual um, representations of different um, different parts of, of culture and society, um, corporate and capitalist and um, of course also the patina of, of old buildings. Yeah. So, um, but I'm really curious what, what attracted you so much to walls themselves? Um, like because so much of your work is created on building walls but not just put on top, like another layer that um, you know you put on top, but it's a real deep investigation um, and involvement with the built material itself. Yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, the, the the idea of of, of digging uh, of into walls and, and walls being the. Hold on, I want to interrupt you. I don't know if everyone here knows what you're talking about when you're even saying digging into walls. What do you do? What? What so do you do? Like What's your slide, process? A slide four here. Yes. I mean, you have machinery. Yeah. Right. And it's like you get a workout <laughs> while you're making art. Yeah. 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 It's kind of a. It's not an easy process, but it's kind of digging into walls and kind of revealing different uh, layers. And yeah. So, but you're running. You're. Do you're, you have the slides back there? I mean, you're running around being a scumbag kid, probably stealing spray paint and writing on stuff like so many of us were. And what you've said so many times, you said today, you're painting with layers of time. Like, what does that mean? Like, explain what that means. Basically, um, this is not the wall, so, but this is something that I was taking from the wall. So this is basically billboards, uh, uh, advertisements that I would go on the streets, take them out, paint them white, and then basically digging into them uh, and revealing the different layers and, and 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 work on them so i was basically it, taking it, stuff from is the there a wall photo if you keep going yeah so there should be there you the go. number yeah yeah that's what i do yeah what <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. 
Yeah. How do you do it? What's the process? Um, well, um, on this, in this case, it was in Shanghai, and we basically used jackhammers, um, chisels, hammers, uh, sometimes explosives, not on this case. But we use um, a lot of, of a big variety of, 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 of tools. Um, and then we use cherry pickers to go up and down, and we dig the wall. That's, that's pretty much it. And Thanks. No problem. You know, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's really, really important. It's this very physical, physical approach to the built environment. So um, if we could, and I hope this works out, if we could um, go to slide two. I put this in here because this is a really early work. And really early. Very, very early. <laughs> and so this is, um, do you want to describe what this is? Yeah, th this is basically me trying to work uh, with the materials I had at the time, um, and and I basically paint with bleach and acid. Uh, I get the old paper uh, painted mm -hmm. with the ink that reacts to acid, and then I just go and sp sp use like kind of a spray of Windex mm -hmm. on the acid, and I just spread it all around, and I paint mm -hmm. with it. Um, this was the really early works, and, but I still yeah. work a lot with this idea, the concept of using materials that are not usually used for right. creation of art, and, right. and that kind of destroy to exactly. create something, so yeah. in this act of destruction. It's I this whole notion of destruction, using finding materials that mm. destroy rather than build in a way. And then if you could go to the slide um, three, please, because I wanted to show that as well. This is an early edging that you did. And, and I see like a really um, pretty intimate relationship between um, the destruction, but then also the notion of um, printmaking, of carving, that you then later employ in really, really big building walls. Um, so we can also go then to the next slide. So I think this is a really early wall, as far as I understand it. Yes. Um, where you, like Roger said, like chisel, um, hammer, sculpt into the wall as a material itself. Um, and I'm really interested in this relationship to the material mm -hmm. because every wall has many different, um, every wall is different. The material quality of every wall is different. Um, so I'm interested in how you approach that. And then I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, the different faces that we see, mm -hmm. uh, because your subject matter is also really specific. Yeah, so I mean, wh uh, what I find interesting in on the walls, it's, it's, re it's really like the kind of the building of all the layers and all the, the, the layers that are exposed to a certain time and how they kind of go and, and, and overlay on them. And in a way, what I try to do is kind of dig onto them and, and, and you know, beyond all the makeup that our cities have, try to dig and go on the visual side of the buildings and try to expose humanity. And that's, the, uh, if I can simplify it, you know, uh, straight away, that's kind of the, um, the visualization that I go through. Then in terms of the portraits, I talk, I work a lot with, with images and, and, and photographs and drawings that I do in the cities where I go with everyday heroes, people that just leave the city and that I, I sketch from. On those on those projects, and then on certain projects, I work closely with communities where we try to support them on issues that are those communities are facing, being in the you know context with uh, the government or context with in terms of climate change tensions, um, and we try to go to get all together and uh, with the team and and try to interview the people and go and carve them back. So in this way, we one of the examples was the video that we had from Rio. Um, it was uh, Morro de Providencia, which is a favela in, in, in Rio, and it was going through a big tension because people were being expropriated. Um, and we were invited by one of the local associations to do projects. Um, and, and they were kind of, um, we felt there was a tension that was an angst within the community that was, uh, at that time, pacified uh, because it was way like quite before the World Cup was happening, and this process was happening because of the World Cup. And uh, we basically 
so the, like that some of the houses were just gone, like you had the favela and some of the houses were gone and what was left was just the empty facades on, on, on both sides. And we went to try to, to understand who were the people that were living there, some for two, three generations. Um, we interviewed them and we I did a sketch and we went to the wall and we carved back uh, the portraits of the people that live in that place uh, with the remainings of the, the, the ruin of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, Why don't we watch the video? Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> and the um, yeah, and basically that puts a spotlight on the issue and people, the press came and then people add kind of a light on it. Que o amanhã é outra parte da vida que ninguém conhece. Primeira favela na história do Brasil, na história do mundo, é, como o, o, esse título de favela surgiu aqui. Eu vim para trabalhar no teleférico, construir o teleférico da Providência. A gente sempre espera que a comunidade entenda como, como uma, uma, uma obra que vai ser boa para eles. Né? Eu acho que a história não está nos barracos, nas casas, está no ser humano. Mas se você tira esse ser humano com o um discurso de que vai, vai alo alocar eles, eles próximos aqui da da comunidade, eles dizem na comunidade, mas é mentira, é fora da comunidade, a comunidade é aqui no Esse que vai descer não vai voltar mais aqui. Se você mora numa casa, você mora 30 anos naquela casa, o dia que você sair, queira ou não queira, você vai... Aí a pessoa sempre tem uma saudadezinha. Você sabe como é que é, eu vou... Você me viu na parede? Você não disse que eu, que eu mudei daqui? Eu não mudei, eu tô continuando morando no mesmo lugar. Olha, o presente só é daqui pra frente. Você olhou pra trás e é passado. Então... Esse processo de remoção deve ter morrido de... Problemas de coração, de estresse, umas cinco pessoas. Em pensar, ela não vem só dor. Mas pra mim tá tão. Não sei se vocês se mudaram quando vocês eram crianças de algum lugar. É, é muito cruel, porque você perde os amigos, né? Você, imagina essas pessoas que viveram a vida toda aqui. E, e viveram antes quando era brabo. E agora que tá bom, né? Porque, teoricamente, tá, tá legal de se viver. Demorou, vai ser melhor. A coisa vai melhorar. Não vai? A coisa vai piorar. Não vai? Mas com a condição, ela nem melhora pra todos, nem piora pra todos. derrubar para dar das nossas casas, inclusive assim daqui também dá tudo para sair, aqui de lado aqui dá tudo para sair. Tem tudo isso aqui vai sair pelo projeto. Esse teleférico, 20, ele vai atingir mais ou menos só 20% da comunidade. Se você ver geograficamente o morro, 
não tem sentido. Então ele não é pra gente. É, além de virar um de passar a ser um ponto turístico, né? Assim como o, o teleférico do alemão está sendo para como para as comunidades de lá, é, eu acho que a, a, a facilidade de acesso que vai ter para a comunidade é muito grande. Né? Então você tem que vai ser o feito no morro. Não existe nenhum projeto de habitação. Eles dizem que existe. Ah, tem um projeto de habitação pro morro. Não tem. Não existe nenhum projeto de construir habitação dentro do morro. Existe projeto de tirar a habitação do morro. Ele ficou falando, não, comprar era com meu dinheiro mesmo daqui. Então comprei, eles vão reformar tudo, vão me dar, diz eles que vão me dar todo acabado, tudo bonito, não sei também. Por enquanto é só de morro. Um, I think that this film so powerfully <clears throat> exemplifies how you work with different communities and how you um, investigate what urban planning and globalism um, does in different communities and local, um, local communities around the world. And you bring a very um, like specific human perspective to it. So how do, you, how do you go about engaging with people in different communities? How do you build relationships? How do you, um, how do you find the people that are willing to share their stories and their opinions with you? Um, I mean, it, it really depends on the project. And, on, uh, and here, for example, we were um, in touch with a local association that was doing work with, uh, social work with, 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 with the community. Um, and that's sometimes true to to associations, local projects that are doing things um, locally, and then sometimes it's a mentor, someone that is trying to be in the middle of uh, is in the middle of the whole process of of conflicted contactors, and sometimes we go after a project or a community that we heard about that um, like in a, we had a few projects in in the suburbs of Portugal that we did. Uh, some of this work, so it, it really depends on, on, on the project and on what we feel like doing as well as the studio. So Roger, you've worked with so many different um, artists that call themselves graffiti writers um, or taggers or street artists. Um, maybe, maybe you could contextualize a little bit for all of us that particular approach. Um, and, and how that also relates to the art world in general, but all of these amazing people who um, take, their, take their work into the urban environment um, without having necessarily permission to do so, that sure. create just really amazing, powerful work. Sure, there's three words that get thrown around a lot. Let's start with that. Street art is the new, in the last 10, 12 years, safe word that really encompasses everything. But street art is one thing, Graffiti is one thing, and then this new culture in the last 10 years of murals is another thing. They're all great, and they can all live together. And it's not that people are stupid and don't know the difference. They've just never been educated or talked about the difference because it's such a new thing in a sense. You know, graffiti is traditional. It's running around. It's mostly letter-based. It's writing your name over and over again for the sake of fame illegally. It's very rarely character-based. And you could be a great graffiti writer and live in a three-month put your name up in a three mile radius of here all the time for the last 10 years. Most people will be like, that's a bunch of junk, I hate that. You can be a street artist and go put up a stencil, a sticker, a wild posting of a Labrador retriever over six months, 20 times. And people are like, look at that artist. They did it illegally, it's the same thing. It's just a different message and what is the Payoff. In a sense, usually the payoff for the street artist is the local skate shop, uh, a local t-shirt brand, what have you, says, oh, can you do a show in our store? Can you do this? Can you do that? Do you want to do a t-shirt graphic? And street art, for better or for worse, has become a very easy, quick way to get notice in the gallery world, in magazines, and of course, especially on social media, is that's how everything spreads now. 
But graffiti and street art play in the same playing field. They play with the same tools. In a sense, they're almost like kissing cousins. And for a long time, the graffiti writer hated the street artist and wanted to kick the crap out of him. And a lot of street artists did get the crap kicked out of them, but that's because they weren't putting in the work that the graffiti artist was putting in. And there wasn't as much dedication. Not all of them. There's a lot of incredible street artists out there, so I don't want to sound like a hater. But there's we a difference. have one of them here. Um, <laughs> and with that, in the last 10 years especially, the mural festivals in so many cities that have sprung up are incredible, and I'm so grateful they're happening. You can go to art stores in almost any major city now and get stencil kits, spray paint made for graffiti. I mean, it's a massive culture. Graffiti is not a subculture anymore. It's just an entire culture with so many subcultures that come off of it. And these mural festivals are incredible, but what's happened is almost anyone that's painting outdoors, often large murals that are wonderful, that are sanctioned, sometimes paid, sometimes unpaid, but they're legal, it's a mural. It's not street art, it's not graffiti. It's often inspired by graffiti or street art, but it's just a mural and it's art. And one thing, you know, Alex, you get called a street artist all the time, but you know, you have more of a background in graffiti and then you keep, you took it and you came up with a new interesting way to bring your art to the world with the layers. But to me, you're not a street artist, you're not a street artist and you're not a graffiti artist. You're just a great artist and you figured out how to harness all those awesome things that you learned working outside and bring it inside. To me, I don't see a difference, uh, which I know is a common question you get of, well, how do you work inside if you're used to working outside? I mean, you've, you're just making great art no matter where it is. Yeah, I mean, I always have a problem. I mean, when an artist works in a studio, he's not called a studio artist, you know? So it's like, I, I don't think the place where you do your art should be the one, the place, like, it should be what defines you, but more where you create it and where you do it. But, but yeah, that's, but that's the problem with techno, like, put, put people tend to put things in boxes. Makes it easier, I guess. And you've seen this culture get fucking huge. Every, you've traveled the world, more places than most people will ever go to do this art. Yeah, I mean, there is, I think you have a, a new wave of artists that are, it's very difficult for me to try to, to, to put them in, in corners, but, but I think it's the new, a new generation of artists that was exposed to a tremendous amount of information, a tremendous amount of, 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 of visual stimulus, um, and now with technology even more, that what they're going to put out there is going to be completely different and, and going to have different aesthetics and different uh, ways to go, you know, so... Th there's a couple things I'm always looking for, and my favorite things are digging up historical crap from the late 60s, early 70s, graffiti, scrawl, early things that are very hard to find because very few people are documenting them. And then, you know, take the 90s through the mid-2000s. I'm so aware of what's been happening around the world. Great things, but nothing that crazy and innovative. You know, once in a while, I'll see crazy, innovative things. And whether it's good or bad, I'm just like, holy shit, how are they doing that? And when I started hearing about you, I was like, oh, okay, we'll see what happens. And, you know, <laughs> six months later, someone else would tell me something else. I'd see some photos. And I think the first time I saw your work in person, I was in Honolulu. And I don't think I talked to you. I don't remember. And I was walking down the street, and I was like, oh, there's that guy. Like, wow, he's really doing it. That looks hard. It's hot out. Like, yeah, it was. It was it and was, it was um, I, I remember I walked by that wall several times over the next few days when you were done and really looked at it, and I was like, I got to pay attention. This is something new. This is innovative. And this is going to be an important person in the art world in, time to, in the years to come. And you're relatively a young artist, and I think you're one of the more important contemporary artists right now. <laughs> so I want to jump in here because um, I'm, I'm so curious about this transition from graffiti and you, you worked traditionally with spray cans, you tagged, mm -hmm. um, and I showed some of these early works that probably happened, well, some of it in parallel, some of it a little bit later, but how, how what, what, what was it that made you jump from the spray can to the sledgehammer and the carving knife and the chisel? Like, Well, um, I remember the day I brought, it was a graffiti jam and I, I just, it was... What's a graffiti jam? 
Graffiti Jam is a gathering of graffiti writers that get together, um, usually on a legal spot, at least, because then there's dif different definitions for graffiti in different parts, but usually legal. Wall, and people all do a lot of fame, where they all do, like, a big mural. Um, and this was, and then one day I just arrived with this idea that I wanted to use a jackhammer. So I brought the jackhammer that I bought very cheap, uh, that broken down after, like, not long, like I, I worked on it and it broke down, but everyone was kind of making fun of me and looking at me weirdly <laughs> and, 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 ma and making jokes. Um, but yeah, it worked and, and then I just kept going. It was not you know, the most beautiful project, but it was the first one. Um, and now the joke's on them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, d we, we all have our our thing and our technique and, and a lot of them they, they still continue to do graffiti today and you know it's mm -hmm. yeah. maybe we can have slide 13 it's just another example of a wall um, so I'm also really curious about how you conceive of the image and how it's translated onto the wall because it's um, um, yeah it's almost again going back to the to the printing technique, there's like a um, negative positive effect. Yeah. So how do you how do you prepare the wall? How do you how how do you create the image that you want to have on the wall? How do you position it on the wall? And then how do you get it on the wall? So just very practical. Okay. Practical technical, terms. Technical. Okay. Um, so what I we usually do is we try to understand what's the layers that the wall has in it. So we do or dig a little bit and we see the different layers and colors we have. And from that moment, um, I pick up on an image or, or or a sketch, and I do the sketch of of, of the image that I want to do with that wall. Um, you sketch people when you visit different places. Do you take photographs of people you meet? Pictures that I collect from old markets, from from old things, and 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 or from sketches. So it's very different a variety depending on the project as well. When you say you sample the wall, it's almost like soil samples, like you're digging in a little bit to see how many layers there are, what's what? Yeah, basically, yeah, that's, because you, you, basically I don't use colors, like palettes of colors, it's, it doesn't really exist, so it's really the layers that are inside of the wall. So what we do is basically we just do a sketch of all the image that we cut out, and then we just let the layers of the wall talk, and they create part of the work in a way. So, so it's really letting the, the visual part of the buildings to dictate what you actually going to do. So you control the process until a certain uh, uh, extent. And but it's intentional because it, it, I, what I try to do is really to let um, the wall, you know, reveal the image as well. Um, have you had surprises where the wall doesn't allow you to do what you wanted to do, or where? The surface of the wall is different at the bottom than it is on the top. Uh, I mean, it's like it's a big undertaking to me. I mean, this is a huge wall. Yeah. This you know, you're physically engaged with it. Um, like this, this all this all art. The material speaks back, right? Your materials are walls. So um, there were several times that half of the image fell off. <laughs> 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 but uh, but there's ways to work around it, and and usually what I try to do is to really incorporate the mistake into the whole composition. But it's a really, I mean, I don't I don't have an image of how it's gonna be really the wall. I just have an idea and a sketch, and then I just let it. I let the wall, you know, play back. It's like almost like a, not a dance. But I don't want to be lyrical, but but it's really like letting the wall do this part as well. So there must be a deep interest in these different layers of history, like the patina, pat, patina, patina of the <laughs> built environment, like all of these different layers that accumulate over time, um, that you slowly uncover through this process. Yeah, I mean, there were several times we found like old murals. We found, I think, once a ring. You, get, you find a lot of things in walls. It's really. Uh, um, and then, on depending if it's a new building, if it's an old building, if it's a different part of the world, mm -hmm. each city uh, have you know their own walls, their own layers, their own history, and you can almost dig onto them and and and, and perceive that. Because I started to do all of this in 
you know, my my city. But then as soon as I started to travel, I started to realize that each city has their own layers, their own sure. histories to bring back, mm -hmm. their own materials that are used for right. construction and so on and right, so on. Yeah, so there are the layers of the built environment, but you're also, in so much of your work, really interested in the influence of the media in general, but also of advertisement and yeah, television and social media. So if you can go back to this image four, please. Um, this is an early work you did um, with advertising posters, like layers and layers and layers of advertisement. Mm. And again, you carved or let a human face emerge. Talk a little bit about that relationship, that tension that you see between um, yeah, the, the world of, of ads. Um, I mean, and, and, and how you scavenge the yes. ad walls from the street. Yeah, I mean, this, all this body of work was kind of, um, it was even previous to, to the wall carvings. And it was mostly, you know, when you go in the cities, and it's, uh, it's in Europe it's more frequent, but you have, when a lot of uh, layers of posters just get lay over and lay over, and they get very fat, and what we usually do is just go paint it white, can you go to the photo that has all the billboards stacked up? Yes, so yeah. if we jump quickly to five and then to six, that would be great. So this is another example of a face emerging from just yeah. walls and walls of advertisement. And then if you go to six, please. Yeah, um, yeah well, so uh, basically the, those walls just get like full of posters over and over again. Um, and uh, the idea was just first it was kind of illegal posters, illegal pasting, so it was not really illegal to work on them and to do stuff on them, so that was a good thing, different from graffiti. Um, but And then um, we would just go take it out or just go on a wall, paint it white, and then just dig onto them and kind of play with all the layers of, of, of time on them. So in a way, it's kind of an archaeologist process of all the imagery that fills our eyes every day and that Indian composes, because everything all our, all the consumerist kind of communication really influences in a way we are and uh, our, you know, our dreams, our um, ideas of, of, of success come from, from communication in general. So, so what I wanted to do was a parallel between that and how, how much of us is us and how much uh, it's influenced by the context and the communication that we are overexposed every day. And that's we comes all that idea and, and this, yeah. Uh, quite explicit piece. Uh, I, I know there's not a ton of time left. I want to talk about why we're here. You made a huge solo show. Is this your biggest show ever? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it was it for sure was the one one of one of the that took longer to plan, and and we were quite courageous, just like to blew one of the walls, which you're gonna see upstairs. Yeah, you let him blow. We haven't even talked about that. You're you're in for a surprise, but. You let, uh, you let him blow something up in your museum. Um, you know, I think um, I, I just choose a different kind of terminology. <laughs> so um, if you did one of your, and I can never say this word, pyrotechnological yeah, pro projects. Yeah. Um, Boom. The first one in the galleries. So we worked with um, the fire department, we worked with an incredible um, company here in Cincinnati, which many of you know, because they do all of the great fireworks in Cincinnati. And so we, and maybe we can go to this image, sorry, uh, 21. So here you get a great sense of um, the work that you will experience in the galleries. So, um, why don't you talk about what we did? Yeah, this show isn't a <laughs> retrospective show. This is all new work. Yeah, it's all new work. Um, I really, I'm a real believer that uh, we should, in a way, um, let the work, like, mm -hmm. I mean, relate to each one of us. Uh, I don't really want to try to talk about it. In, uh, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm very proud of what we achieved yeah. to do and, and all the different installations and body of works. Mm -hmm. So I hope you enjoy too. And yeah. And I, will, I want to leave space for, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, people yeah. to... So 
um, so often here at the Contemporary Art Center, we invite artists to um, really truly engage, wrestle, dance, play with the space itself. So many of the works are new, they're very site specific, of course it is. It gives you an overview over the many different um, philosophical approaches that Alex takes um, to some of the themes that we've broached here. And um, yes, there's also an explosion piece that m maybe you can describe to our audience here. You'll get to see it in, um, in the galleries and there's also a video that depicts the explosion ex itself. But well, maybe you sh we should, I I'm gonna take a step back. So we've been working with Alex for two years on this exhibition. We've worked with him, I mentioned it earlier, I think in 2008, although I think you say 2011, on, <laughs> on an amazing wall yeah. that we did on Fifth Street, and many of you have probably seen that, and then during Blink, we created another wall um, at Finley Market in partnership with Blink, while we were already talking about this exhibition and what this exhibition might look like. And we had a meeting um, maybe a year ago, and we were sitting around the table and we were talking about the different aspects of the exhibition and what it might look like and how it fits in the space and how we pull it all to together conceptually. And um, you got very, very quiet and your team got very, very quiet and I thought like, oh my God, what's up? And they said, well, um, we would really like to do this new project. You know, we've done all of these um, explosion pieces uh, in walls outside and um, and they got quieter and quieter. We would really like to propose an explosion um, inside the galleries. <laughs> and Tyler Hamilton and Josie Vitello, the most amazing um, people here on crew, our installation director and um, Tyler who works really close with them, they were both immediately, oh my God, this is awesome. <laughs> and this is just our attitude. Uh, we really try to um, work with artists to take a new step, to try something daring. We do it in a very um, um, measured way. Like we make sure that we can actually do it. We bring all the right people to the table and we have so many amazing, talented people here in Cincinnati who are willing to try um, the undoable with us. Yeah. So yes, we did a big explosion here mm -hmm. at the CAC about two weeks ago, and it all went well, thank God. <laughs> but well, the fire marshal was right here with us. So I really wanted to thank Joe and Tyler and all, all the whole yes. team, that was pretty impressive. And your team, oh together. my God, I mean, it was amazing. 30 and people who worked tirelessly yeah. and made magic happen. So thanks to the incredible Will's crew, and then uh, my incredible colleagues here at the Contemporary Arts Center, they made magic happen. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So last but not least, mm -hmm. talk about this explosion piece and what um, it reveals and what that term means to you. Um, I really would like to let people see <laughs> the piece. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> but uh, but Roger, do you have another question? Otherwise, we just open it up and we let everybody else ask questions. I mean, uh, one thing that really is important to me walking through the show is everyone's looking at all this work, things we've talked about, you chiseling things out. There's layers, there's old billboards, but there's a lot of technology with what you do too. You take photos, there's a video piece. Uh, so many things are, you know, cut with machines perfectly for some things you need to do. But then you go back and hand touch them. So there is a lot of technology that goes into your work. And as I walk through the show, so many of my senses, you know, are being used by the sound of the explosion in the video to the TV, uh, the TV screens and the stencils in another area. I mean, you really are creating incredible environments. The doors, I'm all of a sudden going down like this crazy maze uh, that you'll see of these vintage doors he does. And, and so many of the vintage doors that are carved, there's little bits and pieces where the door knocker or doorknob was that's not there anymore. So there's light coming through it where you can see through Slide 17. to the other side. I and mean, there's so many senses that come through when I'm walking one of your shows versus a traditional museum show of paintings in a case of drawings. You know, is that intentional or it's just screw it. This is what I do. It's, I mean, uh, um, it, it's, I don't know. It's quite natural for me to try to find uh, 
the, the mediums. I mean, in the mediums, you have a lot of the, the message first, and then as well on the um, on the different tech. As you are exposed to so many things, they just naturally, you know, the ideas come up, and then I just find a way to do them. Um, it's not like I try to do just one with a specific uh, media, um, a certain amount of works. It's more, it's I don't know. It's just ideas comes up, and then I do them with the team that helps me as well, and we find a way to do it. It's so you're just saying you're a genius. No, <laughs> um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Questions. Questions. And we'll hand it uh, First of all, thank you for explaining various types of art. Uh, that was very helpful. Alex, uh, muito obrigado. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question. Do you ever come across in a conflict situation in which you have to play a role of mediation to do that? Or somehow responds to the community in that case? These all appears to be great work and obviously had a lot of community support, but did you ever come across in a conflict situation and second, mm. of course, favelas in Rio is in some ways are spectacular because they're up in the hills. And I mean that, mm -hmm. you know what I yeah. uh, expressed there. But there are favelas in Brazil, in Different many countries. cities. Has this work gone across there? Uh, uh, I hope I'm making sense. That yeah. that's the Sorry, uh, the last question I didn't get it. So, so. Uh, did your work go beyond Rio. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, f first question, y yes, it happened. Uh, we worked in a lot of different environments. Um, and I, I remember one, one time we were doing a project in, it's a, it's a social neighborhood around Lisbon called uh, Quinto de Moche, and we, we kind of went and tried to identify someone that was meaningful to the community, and we found someone that was um, a DJ that started to teach all the other kids how to DJing, and they kind of started a new movement of music uh, of uh, um, Afro house in, in in the in the suburbs of Lisbon. So the guy was really like a kind of an icon. But um, and and we went photographed him, we interviewed him, and we went to do the wall. But a faction of the the neighborhood was not really pleased with that pick. So we had to go home. We kind of had kind of a conflict that the, the people didn't want that. So it, it, there was a kind of uh, a, a movement. And then I just had to extend my hand and talk to people. And, and, and basically, it was a group of kids that uh, they were kind of bored of doing nothing. And then I just talked to them. And we came the next day, talked to them again. And we kind of invite them to be part of the production of the, the piece and, and inviting them to do the piece with us. And they actually did, <laughs> and some of the kids that are still doing um, eventually started to do other stuff related to graffiti as well. So it's sometimes it's not it's not always easy, and it doesn't. I don't want to romanticize everything that we do, but it's it's sometimes it takes a great deal of you know communication and how to get to different stages. Uh, on so many of these projects, with so many of the artists I work with. There's so much conflict, so many things to really get their projects done. And if there wasn't, they'd be easy and everyone would do them. So, you know, kind of anything in life. But so many of the great art projects you see, even just beautiful murals that are, you know, legal, the bullshit that you have to do to get them done is unreal. Absolutely love your work. Regarding um, building facades, for, um, for majority of the buildings that you work on, uh, what percentage are abandoned or what percentage are occupied? Do you obtain consent to work on them? And if so, get proper permitting? Um, yeah, often, uh, yes. Uh, and, and I mean, there was a, when it's abandoned buildings or there is places that people don't really care, um, I often, or I, I try to get permission, but sometimes you don't even know who's the owner, so you cannot really get permission. So, and on those buildings, um, uh, I, it's usually projects that are site-specific. For 
Houses where people live, usually yes, of course. And they have, they have, to have the permission. It's very difficult to do it illegally without, you know, annoying people. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, and it, it's it's what Roger was saying as well. It involves a big deal of of, of you know um, permits and safety measures. You know, I work with the team as well, so I need to make sure that everyone is safe. So it's uh, it's complex uh, as well. As your career has evolved and become so much more known and your team has grown, it's gone from an abandoned building where you just show up and say, screw it, I'm doing it, to permits and really working with the community and having a man on the ground figuring out what you're doing and working with the community is what I assume. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that was more or less the, the path. Growing pains. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, it's probably a very obvious question, but the upstairs, it's permanent? Uh, Reality is permanent forever? Reality. Oh, yeah. uh, ask no. this lady. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> and then the second question is um, the buildings in Brazil or wherever they are in the world, does your team keep track of them? Like, how are they now? How are they 10 years later? Um, well, good question. We, we often, uh, like, we can follow today with social media, people send pictures and, and, and we kind of get in touch with the projects we do. Uh, so we, we are in the loop and we know about them. So. About the uh, if sorry, Deteriorating? yeah. I mean, if they they evolve through time, uh, it's it's really uh, you know it's. I try to go on the surface of the, the the wall. I don't really go through the bricks, and I try to not destroy. And when we feel that it's weakening the wall, we try to seal it and to protect it. Um, but then as well, I like when walls evolve through time, and and well, you know, sometimes they get. A, you know, darker on one side and someone paints it over. So it, the walls kind of have their own life and it, I think that makes them more interesting that they evolve through time. Thank you. That goes back to some of the graffiti history though. Sometimes it doesn't even last the night. You know, it happens yeah. and it goes away. That's part of the beauty of it. Hello, first of all, I want to commend you and CAC on this amazing exhibition. It's really a privilege to have this in Cincinnati, and so thank you so much. Thank you. So we talked a lot about the technical. What I want to know more about is the personal. So when you were in Rio de Janeiro and you dealt with the community and you got to know some of these people in the community that were being displaced, and as you started to work on those murals or artworks, how did that relationship form as they got to see, got to know you, and you got to know them? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, it was, it was, if I remember well, it was a period of almost a, a month, a month and a half of preparation. Um, and, and it was, it's a slow process. You you, you, you went, uh, we went to the association without really knowing what to do. We were wanting to do something, uh, workshop with the community, with the kids of the community. And that's what we started by doing. Um, and then I started to talk to people, starting to understand the different, you know, the, um, different shades of, 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 of the stories of the, the, that the favela was going through and the people that were living there were going through. And that there's big mis big misinterpretation about, the, the, uh, I, don't know, I don't know the first, the right word, but um, it's places that usually are discriminated by just people are discriminated just by living there. So to change this, uh, but in the end, 99% of the people are normal people that work every day. So, so what we tried to do was really to try to humanize and to bring a face to, 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 the, mo to the favela, to try to, to bring a different image, but at the same time, we understood that there was that tension going on. So we had to gain the trust of people, we had to go sit down with them, talk a little bit about the project, show the book, explain what we are doing and why we are doing. Um, and then it, it's really good because it, you really hear good feedback and people discuss things. So, so it's, it's, it's a process that it's always different, and, and, but it, it takes time. It usually takes time. You Thank told you. me uh, yesterday when I got here that you were dedicating the show to someone that was important to Cincinnati and brought you here. Is that something you want to tell all these lovely people? Yes, of course. Um, um, the show was dedicated to Mike Hammond. Uh, I think, I don't know if the family is here, but it was, was the first person to really invite me. Um, 
uh, to Cincinnati and he, he did several, um, he, I mean, he's a very iconic people f uh, person for me because it was my first show that I did in the US as well. Um, and he got me a wall, um, he brought different artists, London Police, different, um, he, he was a very special person and he unfortunately passed away, and, but, but he, he, all his family is here but I, and I really wanted to dedicate this show to him because the legacy that he left uh, was very meaningful to me and I think to the city as well. Um, and yeah, so, so Cincinnati was your first show in the US? It was in Covington, actually. It was I did the wall at the same time on in Cincinnati. So I did a wall here and I did a show in Covington. So, but it was organized through him, and that's why I wanted to dedicate the show to him as well. Yeah, it's a <laughs> yeah, and we all owe him a tremendous, just tremendous respect. For so. Sure. Um, we have one last question here, and then we invite you all to join us upstairs. And um, yeah, we will all be there so we can continue the conversation. So here, here's our last question. Uh, thanks. I was curious if you could say more about your team um, for like the mural that's in Over the Rhine, close to Finley Market, for something that size. How many people does it take to complete that? How long does it take the process in that sense? They're taking up the first two rows here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, th there's a lot of work that is doesn't involve actually doing the wall itself. There's a preparation, logistics, planning of things. Um, but usually it takes like one night of sketching or one day, one night. And then that wall particularly was three, four days. And it was three people, I guess. Three, four people uh, on and off. So yeah, that's usually. And one cherry picker. and. For hammers. <laughs> I will say out of all the projects I've done with so many artists, they're so disorganized all the time and the few times I've worked with Alex or so many of the other people I work with that do big projects, they're like, did you see that supply list from Vils that we got? It's incredible. It's like a great PDF that breaks down everything you need with like diagrams and like we're the link to Home Depot to go get something. I mean, they're, they're organized. They have their shit down. Yes. They really do. So thank you, Alex and Roger. Thank you. Let's go. 